Paul, first, let me tell you how delighted I am to be participating in this project that uh, the ISN has organized called the ISN uh, Video Legacy Project. It's really a well-deserved recognition of all the things that you've done in nephrology and in all the things that you have contributed to nephrology and to your peers and to the students that followed after you. So it's really a great pleasure for me to be doing this. And I wanted uh, perhaps to ask you to start by telling the audience uh, the highlights of your professional career, sort of the stages that you went through, in a sense, frame your professional mm -hmm. careers for me. Uh, and then we'll come back and ask about each one of those uh, specific mm -hmm. areas in more detail. Good. Well, I appreciate your spending time on this. And uh, the answer to the question is that I see uh, myself in uh, sort of three careers. The first uh, was 21 years in the regular Army Medical Corps, medical department, uh, for about um, mainly in research and development. Secondly, uh, 24 years as a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt in nephrology. And then more recently, the last seven years so far, as um, assistant to the Bishop of Tennessee, the Episcopal Diocese of Tennessee. That really involves um, leading uh, congregations and congregational leadership through long-range planning or comprehensive stewardship or evangelism uh, there, uh, in order to make new and good things happen in the church. Uh, the other piece of, the, uh, of this last seven years has been to continue giving grand rounds at Vanderbilt, and uh, most recently in a new project that uh, has to do with uh, evidence-based disease management, uh, which we call uh, in this uh, version of it uh, health assurance coaching, uh, using the coach player model and I hope we can get into that because that I think is one of the most exciting things that's going on in healthcare in the, in the world today and it's fun to be part of that. Great. Yeah. Well before we get to that <clears throat> perhaps we can, um, in fact I want, what I wanted to ask you is to start even with your high school career and university <coughs> career and then how you got into the army mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, because I think you had also some notable achievements when, when you were in, in uh, high school with the Westinghouse. Uh, yes, uh, <coughs> I graduated as a valedictorian of uh, my high school in uh, Shorewood, Wisconsin, born and raised in Milwaukee, really, Shorewood being a suburb. And uh, then in, in the summer, of my, after my senior year, I had won the, the, um, a trip to Washington in the Westinghouse Science Talent Search and found myself rather <laughs> astonishingly as having won the Westinghouse Grand Science Scholarship. And that gave me a four, uh, essentially four years of college education. And I went on to Carleton College. And then, uh, of course, we were in the Second World War. I was deferred in the draft, the, the doctor draft, and uh, then went to medical school. And at that point, uh, really um, finished medicine that is the formal medical training, but I felt by then, it was about 1948, that we would be in war with Russia. And I felt that having been deferred during the entire uh, Second World War because of our st medical studies, that I would be obviously drafted and I'd have to enter. So I volunteered for the Army Medical uh, Intern and Resident Training Programs. And uh, then after about two years of that, I thought I'd better get into uniform. And my first assignment was then at the uh, Army Medical Service Graduate School, later became the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Well, about that time, a, um, the order came down that we were going to establish uh, a dialysis unit. And being the new kid on the block, I was the uh, newest arrival in the unit. And uh, so that I was placed on temporary duty to go to the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital on John Merrill's service. And that, of course, is the time we met John Merrill for the first time and all those colleagues to learn about fluids and electrolytes and renal failure and dialysis using the rotating drum dialyzer. As you may remember, the Willem Kolff invented this machine back in Holland in 1943, 4, and 5. 
and uh, put the uh, design in the hands of George Thorne. And that then eventuated, uh, as I'll, I'll indicate, the, it was an exciting time to be at the Brigham because, you see, George Thorne was the Hersey Professor of Medicine, was working on adrenal function and hypertension. Uh, Francis D. Moore was the Mosley Professor of Surgery and was uh, actively engaged in his metabolic studies in response to surgery. And uh, at the same time, uh, John Merrill had uh, with him or associated with him William P. Murphy, Jr. and Carl Walter in surgery, who were biomedical engineers before there was a, a field like that. And of course, the instrumentation genius Edward Olson out in Ashland, Massachusetts, uh, was the person who fabricated in stainless steel and plastic the original Kolf rotating drum design. And that was the instrument that I trained on and um, the, uh, we then ultimately got one into uh, the uh, Walter Reed General Hospital, into the Brook General Hospital at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, and of course was the unit that we used in Korea. So your interest in nephrology really came by orders of Uncle Sam in a sense. Yes, it was say. nephrology by appointment. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was uh, a new kid on the block and uh, and uh, because I got this TDY, that really was the start and the continuation of my whole What's career. TDY? Temporary duty. I see. I see. <laughs> military <laughs> jargon. Yeah, military jargon. Yeah. Yeah. And, and had you had an interest in nephrology before then, or was really this something that came out, out of nowhere? And uh, I think... Um, uh, had you heard anything about dialysis? No, no? None, none of that. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, we had had a very uh, systematic review of James Gamble's uh, work, uh, the, uh, the ana chemical anatomy of the body fluids, that uh, monograph, and we took our medical students while I was a resident through that. And fortunately, I had that experience because otherwise the Brigham would have been a total, uh, you yeah. know, a confusion. Yeah. Yeah. But we knew our way along already, and then it was just adding on the, the uh, understanding of dialysis and the skills about assembling the machine and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So you took us all the way to the start of the war in mm -hmm. Korea mm -hmm. and the, your knowledge of the Kolf dialysis mm -hmm. machine mm -hmm. and so on. Tell us what you did and how mm -hmm. you transported things to mm -hmm. Korea and yeah. what you did in Korea. Yeah, well the story in Korea really begins in the 1951 or so when uh, Dr. Simeone from Case Western uh, Medical School, uh, Curtis Arts, major at that time, <coughs> uh, and our Captain George Schreiner, our nephrology colleague, and our, uh, Lieutenant Russell Nelson, the urologist, made a tour uh, of the wounded, uh, wounding situation in Korea at that time, and I uh, have it uh, to show you how that how that began. Now, this is Sandbag Castle with the uh, with the artillery burst, uh, which is uh, indicated the main line of resistance. The front line was just behind that uh, that ridge, and if a casualty were then uh, encountered, uh, he would be put on a, in a littered jeep that you see here coming along the road. And, uh, the, and then uh, his first stop would be to be unloaded from the jeep and entered into a um, first uh, battalion, um, battalion aid station. Now, if the wounding was severe enough, uh, then the patients would be uh, uh, evacuated by helicopter, and they were transported in that, uh, in that sort of canopy outri canopied outrigger uh, and uh, brought to the Forward Surgical Hospital, the Mobile Army Surgical Hospital, the MASH. And uh, here was a MASH uh, operating room. Uh, these, uh, these operating room tables would go 24 hours a day as long as casualties were coming in, and it was a, uh, a very exciting piece of surgery. Now, if in the post-operative period, uh, various wounding problems would, of course, then occur, the, the survival of patients thereafter, and then if acute renal failure supervened, then instead of about a 10% post-operative mortality, that would rise to about 90%. So the survey team documented the variety of surgical problems, including uh, acute renal failure. And the decision was therefore made to deploy a surgical research team attached to a MASH hospital and to establish a lab and a uh, dialysis unit uh, 
at, it turns out, the 11th Evacuation Hospital. And um, the surgical research team I uh, have assembled on, in this group, um, left to right is uh, Mac Olney, and then myself, and then Captain John Howard, who uh, was a commander of the team. And in the middle of the group is uh, Dr. Francis Moore, a professor from Harvard, who came out to uh, work with us and to see how the, how the injury uh, was not in the surgical operating room at uh, the Peter Van Brigham Hospital, but the way it was under tents in, in real live combat. Uh, Bob Post is the next one, uh, to moving to the right, and uh, Michael Ladd, and then uh, Russell Scott, a urologist. Michael Ladd is a very interesting person. Tell he's us, a, tell us about um, him. He's a uh, was a protege of Homer Smith. Now I never met Homer Smith, unfortunately, but I do have his book, and this is the book called "The Kidney Structure and Function in Health and Disease." I consider it anything you ever wanted to know about the kidney but didn't have the temerity to ask. And uh, it turns out that this uh, thing was published, in, this book was published in 1951. It has 898 pages of text and 2,300 references. And it's all here. And uh, it's, uh, it's the closest I've come really to knowing the, really the father of nephrology in the United States. But uh, Mike contributed, uh, coming back to this, the, uh, the f some fundamental understandings of post-traumatic renal failure that uh, impacted on the way we conducted the, the situation at, at, uh, the, uh, at uh, the 11th Evacuation Hospital. Now, uh, essentially, what I have here is, uh, is some data. It's the graph of uh, Mike Ladd's data, which I don't think has been seen in, uh, in the light of day up to now. And I think it's so important that I wanted to include it here. And uh, this is a clearance of uh, PAH uh, on, the, uh, on the ordinate and uh, versus time postoperative on the abscissa. And there's several things to be seen by inspection here. Uh, first of all, uh, you have to know the, um, that the patient's data uh, who were less severely wounded are uh, seen in the open circles and the more severely wounded in the closed circles. And what this basically says is that every patient who is traumatized in any significant way will develop renal insufficiency. So every, re every person responds with a degree of renal shutdown. The less the renal shutdown, the quicker the recovery. The greater the renal shutdown, the, uh, the, lower, the greater depression of clearance, the longer it takes for those patients to, to recover. Uh, these are all non-oliguric. These are all, this, in other words, the human lesion is primarily a diuretic lesion, not an oliguric lesion, which is one of the things. Now, there are five or six points right down on zero in this graph, and uh, Mike decided that with a clearance of zero, they really need to be uh, evacuated to the renal center with the dialyzer, because he thought they would shut down and we would need to dialyze them. Well, it turns out the only patients that were ever admitted to a renal center by virtue of a CAPH clearance, you see, that's not a usual way of referring people to dialysis, but this, was, this came from there. All of those patients remain, were non-oliguric, and we published them ultimately as non-oliguric acute renal failure. Had never seen that that way before, and uh, therefore we concluded that oliguri is an unusual or ex or rare exception to the total picture of uh, renal insufficiency, and that that total uh, the that the oliguric uh, disease we estimated ultimately was about one in two hundred casualties that made it through evacuation, made it through surgery and into the post-op period. So it's a very infrequent thing. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it depends, uh, it's the oligurics that make the literature in nephrology. And we don't have, you see, the, uh, the literature uh, really seeing the entire picture of acute renal failure, which we have here. This ratio of oliguric and non-oliguric mm -hmm. that you mentioned in the war casualties, mm -hmm. it sounds a little bit much much more non-oliguric than what we see in the hospital. Is that because they had any IV administration mm -hmm. protocols for wounded at that time? 
the, uh, the, the main issue had to do with type-specific uh, compatible whole blood I and see. thorough uh, uh, energetic resuscitation. We did not have any particular pharmacological interventions for, for these folks. But it was, uh, as, a, as we saw it, a very interesting development. Well, that leads us then to the uh, videotape that should be incorporated here um, in the whole sequence that um, t t told us about the, uh, the uh, actual operation of the renal center. It shows uh, how the machine's assembled, how it's run, how we dealt with patients coming in by helicopter and the, and the pre-op workup and all of the things that we needed to do. Uh, and it was a very exciting time. Um, I ultimately, tr actually, uh, uh, Lloyd H. Smith, the f lately professor of medicine at San Francisco, was uh, he and uh, Bob Post came out and set up the unit and was and that was running. I took a, took over, in other words, a, an operating situation, right. and then ran it through about fifty some patients and reported those in the American Journal of Medicine then in 1955. Is which, where the uh, where the publication was, so that was a pretty that was a pretty exciting time. Now the video goes here, in other words. Right, right. Are you going to comment on the video? Uh, no, the no. video is a voiceover, no. okay, and uh, all the comments are already on film. Okay. So you did how long? Uh, a stint did you do in Korea? About nine months. Nine months. Mm -hmm. And this was. Toward the end of the war? No, this was 52, 53. Well, so yes, the, 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 uh, the uh, com combat went on a little bit longer. Right. And then what did you do? Well, I went to, uh, uh, I finished my residency then with, uh, with Dr. Barry Wood and Dr. Carl Moore at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and then got the invitation to take over the kidney center of the, um, of the surgical research unit so-called SRU, or Institute of Surgical Research, which it is now, at uh, Brook Army Medical Center, Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, Texas. And uh, that, uh, then I joined the research unit there. So you see my career continued in R&D, really. Yes. B before we go on to that subject, tell me a little bit about your recollection of um, Merrill, who I got to know a little bit also, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. tell me the impression yes. you had. Yes. Yes, I was, uh, and you'll see his picture after a little bit, but uh, John, um, to me, was uh, the outstanding characteristics to, to me is his good-humored, low-key gentlemanliness. Yeah. Uh, I had the sense that, um, that here was a person who was inquisitive, highly intelligent, gentle with the people he worked with, encouraging, and um, uh, just a lovely person to work with. And uh, the, the, he, he and Barry Wood and a few others that I've met in the course of time had that marvelous characteristic of creating an atmosphere around him that um, of course one did one's best. One wouldn't think of doing less than one's best or do a sloppy piece of work. Not that he would be um, critical and uh, obnoxious about it, but it just wasn't the, the level of work that one wanted to turn in. Yeah. And um, aside from his skills later in French and the fact that when we visited Paris that Gabriel Richet then drove us to, uh, to around the corner and said, that's where John Merrill lived when he was here. <laughs> now that doesn't sound like a very yeah. exciting comment, but it indicated that for the people who knew John well in Paris, that his presence there was a major contribution. Of course, they were working on transplant primarily yes. at Jean yes. Ambourget's uh, organization. Yes. We'll get into some of that because okay. that was exciting okay. too. Okay. Well, let's go back then to mm -hmm. your, your stint at the Brook Army Medical mm -hmm. Center yeah. in Fort Sam Houston, yes. Texas. Well, when we arrived, we of course were out of the rice paddy and we now could do the rotating drum dialysis and really have a wonderful time. You read the literature, you just do this right and they do well. And it turns out it was worse. We had about an 80% mortality in our first selection of patients. And my associate and I uh, looked at each other and, and the question is, you know, is this unique? How, uh, what are we doing wrong? What's going on here? And so with about a year's advanced preparation, I invited with, the, obviously, the Surgeon General's strong support, 
uh, convened then for a three-day closed meeting in October 1957, the thing that was called the Study Group on Acute Renal Failure. And um, reading really uh, from uh, left to right at this meeting, the first morning, uh, we have Dr. George Schreiner, uh, Dr. Hadley Kahn, Dr. Garland Herndon, Dr. Paul Doolin, who my, was my counterpart in the Navy, uh, Dr. Uh, Bill Blumley, and Dr. Graham Bull, and then Dr. Willem Kulf, the inventor of the rotating drum. And um, the, uh, then uh, from uh, right to left standing is Milton Rubini, then Gabriel Richet, who brought Jean Ambouget's experience at Hôpital Nacaire to us, and then John Merrill, obviously, and then um, next to him, Dick Mason, my first associate, Arthur D. Mason, Jr., and uh, John Kiley, and myself. Now, essentially, we had in that one room all the people in the world who had published acu on acute renal failure by that time. And the idea was to close the doors and say, now what really happens? And that first, you can see the data, of course, on the, on the uh, tables. And we all got the data out and uh, combined on the first morning the, the uh, incidence and mortality data that we had on acute renal failure of the four or five ca um, categories. And you see that we had uh, 1,044 cases with an average mortality of 49%. And then the post-traumatics that we were interested in was about 66%. So we knew that our experience was not unique that all of this did contrast with the contemporary literature, and we knew that something had to be different. Now, right then, you see, we had the choice. Were we going to continue to do what we always did just to get what we always got, or were we going to do something for sort of fundamentally different? And that's what I call a paradigm shift. That's the new way of thinking. That's the exciting thing, when you're not locked into something you're always doing when it's unsatisfactory. And, of course, what we were doing that was unsatisfactory is indicated on this classic slide from that era. During an oliguric phase, obviously, the uh, blood chemistries get abnormal and the patient gets sick and the EKG begins showing the bad signs of potassium intoxication. And uh, then you dialyze with this big dialyzer as infrequently as possible and uh, the patient wakes up, feels better, chemistries are better, and as long as oliguria persists, you dialyze as often as you need to, but as infrequently as possible, until diuresis recovers and the kidneys take over the extracellular fluid composition again and the patient recovers. That was the situation. But you see, some of the patients didn't live that long and had all the complications of wound de and the post traumatics of wound dehiscences and infections and, and, uh, and under malnutrition, wasting. A, a bad disease. Moreover, the dialyses were often emergent at 2 in the morning. We thought the patient would last till morning. Oops, no, we had to come in and do that. And it was a, it was a, a really sort of tough scene. Well, obviously, we needed to do something, something different. And that was really the, uh, the uh, paradigm shift. Well, what was the paradigm shift? Uh, the argument was relatively simple. If the big dialyzer can reverse a developed syndrome and chemical abnormalities, then a little dialyzer used every day should be able to prevent those. So we called this prophylactic daily dialysis. The idea was to uh, prevent all these things. And as, and as soon as we began that, you can imagine the whole scene changed. Dialyses became routine, and we uh, stopped having emergencies, and a number of other things I'll mention in, in, the, in the meantime. But there was another feature to this that interested me, and that is that if the chemistries got better and the patient felt better, the, whatever this intoxication was might indeed uh, intoxicate other body cells and tissues and organs and functions and biochemistry. The possibility here was that if the, if the symptoms went away, that is, if we relieved those elements of intoxication, maybe other elements of intoxication would go away too to put it in sort of the bottom line. A patient with acute renal failure should be taken through his acute renal failure, his post-operative course, his post-onset course, as if he didn't have renal failure. The, the consequences of renal failure should be eliminated from the post-operative, let's say, in the traumatics, post-operative course of these folks. That was the vision.
And we, our, our first experience, uh, in, as we published in 59 and in 60, were absolutely dramatic. This was a revolutionary change in our experience. And as you see, the little dialyzer, in this case the McNeil Collins, one square meter or so, and this young fellow um, uh, uh, with, a, I think, a transfusion reaction, I don't remember now, uh, he could eat uh, hamburger and ice cream during dialysis, and we'd never seen that before. And in the uh, patients we had, for instance, across the top we, of, the, of this uh, picture, these are people, the, the persons uh, are left to right are 14, 18, and 27 days uh, following onset of their renal failure. The two in the lower panel uh, are patients with bilateral renal cortical necrosis. They did not survive, obviously, but they're at 48 and 86 days po post onset. And we'd never seen patients look like that after that length of time in Oliguria. And we felt that we were onto something. Now, legacy-wise, I think what we're seeing here, is the legacy of this is really in the um, intensive care units, the continuous therapies we now have in intensive care units. I think the uh, maintenance hemodialysis three times a week in chronic renal failure end stage is, uh, is, a, uh, is a consequence of this. But more specifically, it's the daily dialysis, daily short dialysis, the overnight dialyses every day of patients with end stage with uh, chronic renal failure. And uh, I think the, the uh, and essentially what I see is that 40 years later, yes. we're, we're doing for <clears throat> chronic what we were doing for acute. Right. Uh, and uh, and uh, it makes me think that renal failure is all one story and we simply need to do dialysis right and that's every day. And, uh, and I think that, th that this is now a major change uh, that we're just now Beginning to, beginning to see. So what we're doing right now for acute renal failure is really rediscovering the data and, and the work that you have done in the past. On yeah, the well, it, I think the idea gets around, whether it relates mm -hmm. to a particular piece of literature. The, uh, the key thing is, is that we need, to, uh, we need to prevent the illness and the abnormalities. Carl Shellstrand probably says it as well as anybody. He says, you know, early on in dialysis, we found that two dialyses a week was better than one. Then we found three dialyses was better than two. And he says, why, oh, why did we stop at three? And of course, he's uh, well on to, along with right. uh, colleagues primarily in France and Italy, are uh, yes. now doing the daily yes. story. Yes. And it's exciting yes. to see those results. Okay. While at uh, Fort Sam Houston, I, if I recall, you had also done some work in the lab to supplement mm -hmm. or to corroborate yeah. your clinical observations. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about this? Well, the, the uh, stimulus for the lab work was really Arthur D. Mason, my co colleague, who was so tired of doing dialysis and having these terrible results, although he appreciated the daily dialysis and, the, and recognized the change there. And his interests were really toward the lab and uh, the question was, how can we study the uh, pathogenesis and prevention of acute renal failure in the lab? Uh, it's critical that we, the, you can see the Army interest is not only in taking care of sick troops and wounded right. troops, but it has to do with anticipating what their needs might be wherever they're deployed in the world. And so the issue here is now how can we deal with this acute renal failure and prevent it? Well, first of all, we had to have a model to work in and in quantity, and uh, the uh, the um, uh, at that time, you have to remember in the late 50s that the uh, that it was generally agreed in the field that ischemia was causing renal shutdown, was causing acute tubular necrosis, and uh, we ourselves felt, as we thought about it, that ischemia is a very slippery term. Uh, it uh, implies, but the literature, the use of the term in the literature is very imprecise, that there is an oxygen and nutrient debt, that the necrosis happens because the demand for oxygen and nutrients in the kidney exceeds their supply in, with, in situations of reduced blood flow. Well, it turns out that the, because of the, the uh, uh, because of the, uh, uh, assumption that it was reduced blood flow without thinking of the oxygen debt issue, uh, 
This led to models that had to do with clamping the renal artery and pouring a norepinephrine into the renal artery. The problem with it was, with all that was, it was based on an assumption that we felt was insecure, but also that uh, this, these, uh, these procedures produce infarction in the kidneys, and in the autopsies of our combat casualties, even the severely wounded ones, we did not see infarction. So to me, the, anything that had to do with clamping and norepinephrine was irrelevant. The other issue, maybe it wasn't, but that's the way we thought about it, and the other issue was the fact that um, that uh, the people who published, unless we missed the literature, the, uh, could have, but the people who published on this, these ischemia models had never documented the analogy between that model, whatever it was, and a spontaneously reversible acute renal failure in people. And so we, uh, the, essentially we, we just took another tack entirely. In fact, it might be a new paradigm shift there because that was a prevailing view. We took it exactly the opposite. We looked for a model primarily in rats because we knew to study many of them. And we found through the work primarily of, of uh, Dr. Lalik in Sydney, Australia, we found a pigment lesion which we then used and documented thoroughly. It required sodium and water depletion for about 48 hours prior to the injection of the of the pigment to induce the lesion. Well, the, uh, the uh, advantages that we could study that and that went on. But back to the ischemia story, I uh, presented the arguments against ischemia at the first International Congress of Nephrology in Avion in France. And uh, that was, of course, the birthday of the ISN. And, uh, and we uh, had, were situated in this lovely hotel across from Lausanne and Lake Geneva, and it was uh, Hotel Royal, and we were in the midst of this. And that really, uh, I remember, because of two signal events. I'm pretty sure these were together in the same thing. One was an encounter with Gene Oliver, who'd done the nephron dissections, of course, and had, had indicated that in shock you have the ischemuric episode, you see. Well, uh, uh, Gene Oliver and I and a couple other people all got in this little French cage elevator. You know, their little cages are open and uh, the thing goes up and so on. And as we, we talked, I was about this far away from him. And uh, he, uh, he said, you can't look at the pathogenesis of renal failure with just little, little keyhole peeps through microscopic slides. And, and I, you know, I was sort of under attack, but I, I just said I thought we had a pretty good model. But that was a, a direct point uh, that I uh, I'd voted against ischemia, and uh, that was perhaps mm -hmm. built into that. The other was Jean Ambouget, because I had a chance at that meeting, either that or the Fourth International Congress, I've forgotten quite which, to, he to meet him and to hear him talk. His, after that presentation of his at that First International, I think that's when it was, uh, it's obvious that, uh, that this was an outstanding presentation. His colleagues were thrilled with that presentation, and they pointed out what elegant and beautiful French it was. Well, of course, I couldn't understand a word <laughs> of it, but uh, the point is that listening to it, it sounded like music. I thought that I was hearing something across between a Mozart and a Saint-Saëns piano concerto. You know, it was musical. And later when I got to meet him, I, uh, there that conversation was in English, but um, uh, it's obvious that uh, here was a bright mind, inquisitive, forward-leaning, absorbing the, uh, the, uh, the conversation, asking questions, and uh, a thoroughly charming individual, uh, but extremely bright. You could see the excitement that it must have been to, uh, to work with him. And of course, we got to meet uh, Gabriel Richet, his protege, in the study group that we just saw. So the um, Essentially, we then took the, uh, the pigment nephropathy, just to finish that story, we, uh, we could study platoons of rats uh, mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the gathering and uh, follow all of their characteristics. We could look at the urinary flow by collecting it, and uh, then we could see that uh, in exactly the same as the human situation, a given inciting episode would produce a large variety of responses in the kidney, some oliguria, mainly diuresis, more or less pigment, things of that sort. And so it was an exciting development. And of course uh, that then 
uh, gave us the next piece, which had to do with looking at the behaviors of these animals. And maybe I see the point of all this rat model business led on to the next paradigm that we would counter, and that was this uh, the sense of uh, of looking at these animals. Well, if you get a group of a dozen or so rats who are ready for their injection or blood drawing or whatever, we noticed that uh, you know how rats do; they sort of mill around, and we noticed that a couple of them were reclusive and less mobile. They were a different observable behavior. And it turns out they were the ones that had the hyperkalemia and the severe azotemia, the more severe evidence of renal lesions. Well, it turns out then that we, uh, about that time an experimental psychologist came along and, and happened to drop in the lab, wondered whether he could do some experiments uh, while he was a faculty member at, a, at, the, grad, at the field school and uh, work with us in his spare time. And so we said, sure. So we built him a tea maze, simple maze, that the rats could be put in and we could run to a, to a reward, a food reward. And uh, we said, well, if we'll do that if you will take some of our, our uh, animals with acute renal failure and run them. And lo and behold, what we did, uh, we found that the, that the prolongation of the running time uh, was really superimposable on the BUN curve. And all of a sudden it began to occur to us that there's a difference between disease and illness. The disease in the kidney happened within minutes of the induction injection at zero time in this, but the illness of, uh, manifested in the, in the delayed running time uh, w uh, occurred 48 hours later. And so you see, disease and illness are two different things, and that really has focused our attention and carried us uh, really forward from that time on. And that brought us really to our new paradigm number two and um, in the behavioral studies. The, um, the, it, the basic notion that illness in an organism is really detected by illness behavior. Once we focused on that, it led us to the point that illness behavior, like other behavior, is, is mediated by the central nervous system. And then it followed that instead of writing subjective progress notes, we might be able to quantify the abnormal CNS function that produced the illness behavior. And we would have then a quantitative way to look at the degree of the impact in the Ill, for the illness in, a, in an in individual beyond uh, all the things about, uh, about the chemistries and the other kinds of things we normally look at. Could we use the, the CNS as an intrinsic uh, marker or, or uh, a monitoring system to see the development of the illness in these folks? So that was, that was sort of where we where we went. I retired uh, and actually at uh, Walter Reed, uh, moving then from Brook to Walter Reed, we were hooked up with the Department of Psychiatry there. And in that particular situation, uh, they had operant conditioned monkeys, monkeys who would press levers in response to a stimulating program. And we were able to put a, an EEG montage in the skull, on the skull and we were therefore be able to, we were able to acquire the EEG as well as measure lever pressing and we could uh, occlude the ureters or take out the kidneys and do peritoneal dialysis as you can see in the sitting conscious lever pressing uh, monkey <coughs> and essentially as we've uh, we've shown before uh, that uh, in in uh, some of the publication but just to summarize here you can see that the class, as the as the ureter was occluded toward the left end of the of the uh, gra of the um, picture, the BUN in the lower panel continued to rise, of course, and inversely, the lever pressing behavior deteriorated, and the proportion of slow waves in the EEG increased, slowing being a char characteristic finding. Well, then we did peritoneal dialysis in that vertical panel toward the right end of the picture, and you can see that the lever pressing uh, behavior improved, the 
uh, slow waves began decreasing, that is the proportion of faster waves uh, supervened in the EEG, but the BUN didn't change. And that's because we put urea in the dialysate at the level that it was in the blood before dialysis. Now the fact that we had behavioral and EEG improvement without change in the plasma urea gave us our first indication. See how exciting all this is? We've never done that before. It was our first indication that urea has nothing to do with the concentrations that normally occurs with the clinical illness. And we began seeing the possibilities of separating, uh, the, of, of getting at the solute parameters, causes solute-wise of why uh, people, uh, the uh, patients get sick the way they do in uremia and how dialysis makes them better. So this was a major, you see, new step. And at that point, I retired from the, from the Army. <laughs> what year was that? This was 1969. And then what did you do? Well, then I came to join Earl Ginn <coughs> at, uh, at uh, Vanderbilt. And, um, and then uh, hooked up quickly with Dr. John Bourne, who was uh, in biomedical engineering, and with his set of colleagues and graduate students. And the result was that we were able to, to develop a real uh, be, uh, a new set of, of, uh, of these measures. We were supported at that time with, uh, by the NIH in the Artificial Kidney Chronic Uremia Program, stimulated by the work in the EEG by John Kiley and George Schreiner's p uh, paper on uh, the mental and personality changes in the uremic syndrome. The, all of that seemed to come together, plus, of course, the background that we brought to, to this thing experimentally. And uh, our new behavioral measures then were, uh, were put together on a uh, mobile uh, unit, which could be rolled around to the dialysis, in the dialysis unit, to the chair side for um, uh, recording of both the EEG and psychometric tests uh, administered by a TV monitor a patient would respond by uh, button pressing, much like the monkeys. That's how we wouldn't say that, of course, but the, essentially the, the, um, the, the uh, button pressing in response to stimuli gave us the choice reaction time, yes. various kinds of measures that yes. would uh, do that. Well, the EEG, of course, was tape recorded and then reduced by computer and digitized so that the power of the EEG could be uh, detected in each of the major frequency bands and ratioed one to another so we could see the preponderance of slow waves uh, increasing or decreasing. So the more severe renal failure had the slower waves, a, a fundamental response improvement to dialysis and a further improvement to transplantation. That is, we could see that change in both the psychometrics and in the EEG um, power spectrum analysis. Well, this gave us a chance then to look at dialysis and varying doses of dialysis. And we found that when you dialyze more, the brain is working better by these methods than if you dialyze less. Again, there's an in, the intrinsic marker system does not have to do with, with uh, chemical measures of one sort or another but does have to do with the expression of the illness in terms of uremic symptomatology. And that intrinsic organic participation of the brain in the disease and, and the illness of the patient, to me, was really the, really the crux of this issue. And it was so exciting to see it all work uh, as we had, uh, had suspected. Tell me a little bit about some of your colleagues at Vanderbilt in, uh, that helped you do this work. Well, the... Uh, <coughs> the um, the primary uh, people uh, that have helped along were, uh, of course, John Bourne, as I indicated in uh, in uh, the um, uh, in biomedical engineering and and that set of graduate students. Um, I would, had marvelous support by Earl Ginn, uh, at least originally, and uh, the the work seemed to continue because of the of the support. I remember uh, Grant Little, the professor and chairman at that time mentioned to us that, um, that uh, he, uh, uh, <clears throat> that uh, given the, uh, the, the possibilities that we might indeed uh, reinvestigate all of, uh, of internal medicine, that is symptomatic illness. 
because we developed this integrating hypothesis that we uh, show here. That is, any um, disease that makes symptoms that we can see as illness behavior suggests that the CNS is generating those symptoms. So our thought was is that the central nervous system is sort of like a black box. The disease, if it makes symptoms, does so via the CNS. So our idea was that neurobehavioral probes should be able to detect those changes in the CNS regardless of what the symptomatic disease was. And if therapy then would improve the disease and make the symptoms go away, then the CNS measures should also show that particular change, but in objective terms instead of in the subjectivities of, of the, um, of the, of the um, progress notes. Right. And so the integrating hypothesis, when uh, Grant saw that, he said, well, you could investigate the rest of internal medicine uh, in that way. We d we're never that far along with it. Then uh, we went on to the, um, to, uh, the, uh, the notion of how to pursue this in the lab. And uh, the, we had at that time the association of Dr. Jonathan Lippmann, a very ingenious and very skillful neurophysiologist. And uh, what we ultimately learned how to do is to do peritoneal dialysis in rats. And we, at the same time, were able to acquire the EEG in those same rats, who were, which were, bilaterally nephrectomized. And so essentially what we were able to do is to, is to connect, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, is to allow the rat, bilaterally nephrectomized rat, to deteriorate his EEG, and we were then able to do peritoneal dialysis and we got therefore into the next paradigm that had to do with solute specific dialysis because you see the independent variable is the dialysate composition the dependent variable is the EEG effect and we have a compressed spectral array here of the EEG and the TAR in the right upper corner is theta alpha ratio that is the ratio of the power in the theta range from 3 to 7 hertz to the power in the alpha range 7 to 13 hertz. So theta to alpha power ratio is shown in the top uh, uh, graph as uh, the sham operated animal and you see that the rat's normal is, uh, power is around 6 to 7 hertz. But if the animal then gets nephrectomized and begins to deteriorate you can see the waves slow to around 3 to 4 hertz. Then you can see the theta alpha ratio rise from uh, 165 percent to 290, almost three times the, the, um, the amount of power in the slower range. So this gave us the quantitative estimate of how to, how to uh, get at that. And these rats were dialyzed through a peritoneal catheter? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, indwelling peritoneal catheter and we had them lined up, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten of them, and the computer would drive the switching box that would then access the EEG serially from the 10 rats, one after another, 24 hours a day, and except when they were being dialyzed twice a day. So we were able with equilibrated peritoneal dialysate to, uh, 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 to approximate the, uh, or estimate the, uh, the blood levels in those, in those animals. And so we had a, a beautiful system for that. Were you able to continue this work uh, while you were at Vanderbilt? Uh, well, we ultimately had to stop. We uh, decided, that, first of all, this is hugely labor intensive, as yes. you can imagine, and yes. what we really needed was some, some funding, and therefore we applied, of course, to the uh, General Medicine Study Section B uh, uh, on three occasions and the Biophysical Study Section at NIH on one occasion and failed all four times. Now you can imagine that that was a pretty significant disappointment. Now I can't really fault the medical se the study sections uh, because they are the nephrologists were focused correctly on the kidney, uh, but their focus on the disease in the kidney left really very little room for the illness in the patient, and we felt that that had some claim for uh, for further exploration. We found that the neurologists in the biophysical group were not interested in the kidney any more than the kidney people were interested in the brain. 
And so I came across, I decided that this was really a peerless application. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it occurred to us much later that we should have asked for a special study section and didn't. And that the uh, data are simply there. We published again in the uh, ISN journal, the Kidney International, in 1979 and, and uh, again in 1990, uh, this uh, entire sequence. So that's, um, that's where all that, uh, okay. all well, that lasted. I know when I joined at the faculty here, you were mm -hmm. also involved with clinical activities mm -hmm. at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about that and specifically the MDRD mm -hmm. study and yes. the modification of well, the Well, uh, I spent about a dozen years as co-medical director with Dr. Keith Johnson in the Dialysis Clinic Incorporated, the, especially the dialysis unit here in Nashville. And uh, I was impressed increasingly with the, um, with the de dependency and despondency of the end-stage kidney disease patients on dialysis. What impressed me was the fact that I was somehow responsible for everything that happened to them. And I got tired of that. And I felt that what we really needed to do was to prepare people for end-stage much better than we regularly did. So uh, with, the, um, with that, uh, about that time actually, uh, rather fortuitously I guess, the uh, modification of diet and renal disease study came along. And here was an opportunity for us really to get in early during in progressive renal disease. Well, that, uh, that was a marvelous experience because we learned from the patients a whole new approach. The most successful patients that we had, as a matter of fact, managed their own disease. I think well, quite aside from whatever we did with progressive renal disease, the main learning for us for the MDRD was what the patients taught us. Namely, they became believers in their self-worth and concluded, in effect, that they were worth it was worth working on staying with the program, that is to say, to be with the regimen. When they believed that they were worth something, then it follows that to, uh, to work with the regimen and, do, and do, uh, adhere to the, to the protocol was worth it. There's no point in doing that unless one thinks it's worth doing. And so they decided this, the successful ones. So it finally determined, we finally learned that the main contribution we made was all of us in the, in the team reading from the same page that you are worthy, you're, it's worth the effort, and the person who's going to win is the player, not the coach. And that turned the whole situation around. We, uh, the example I like to quote is, uh, if I see in the clinic now a patient um, a half hour, or uh, me and my team see a patient for a half hour every three months, let's say. It would not be the study, but it would be a clinical operation. If I see a patient every three months, there would be 2,880 waking half hours between visits. Now, since my half hour is 0.03% of that waking time, who is managing the patient? It's quite obviously the patient is managing the patient in the 99.97% of the time that is awake, well, that he's awake between visits. Well, if that's the case, then it follows to get good management, patients have to become believers. They have to become competent. And by becoming competent, they become confident. It places the responsibility for the management of chronic disease, not only renal disease, but all disease, all chronic medical disease, right where it belongs, in the player. It's the player who makes the touchdowns and the home runs and the baskets and the goals and so on. But you see what it does. It takes the doctor and the patient away from their opposite uh, situation, the one-up doctor and the one-down patient. All of a sudden, in the coach-player model, they come around in synergy so that it becomes both the coach's and the player's interest to win the game. The coach wants the player to win but doesn't do the playing. The player does the playing, so it's in the coach's interest 
to increase the skills and the understanding to make a good player out of that situation. Now, I think we can begin to see some of this happening in the evidence-based disease management literature, which is, of course, burgeoning. But you see, all of those, all of those um, uh, educational interventions are still sort of external to the patient. The coach-player model of what we now call health assurance coaching is the, is the name of this thing. I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a neat term for this. That health assurance coaching that embodies evidence-based management, places the responsibility on the player, and uses a coach-player approach, I think is the wave of the future in, in medical care in general, and particularly for chronic medical disease. And I think it's one of the most exciting developments. It's a new paradigm shift. It goes beyond so-called educational interventions because it evokes adherence from inside the patient and avoids the mindset of the prescriptive de uh, uh, um, directive uh, health care provider attitude. So, uh, you know, I th this is then the... the uh, the new paradigm number four, and I think is it's really the uh, it's really the way this this needs to go. So, mm -hmm. in a sense, not making the patients just know about the disease, but take control mm -hmm. of their lives, take control of their illness, mm -hmm. and manage yeah. it. And with your coaching behind, mm -hmm. and this is what we learned. The, you see, the MDRD study could never have produced the adherence, at least in our experience, that it did without the patients really coming aboard as believers. Yeah. And it was, uh, and uh, all the time they were away from us, they had to be on the regimen. Yes. And we have evidence that that was the case, and they did, they, the successful ones did just beautifully. And it's interesting, isn't it, that they taught us it could be done. Yes. yes. Before we get off the Vanderbilt era, uh, do you remember any particular fellows that you trained in your program, sort of, that uh, you want to mention or talk about? Well, I don't recall uh, very specifically the Vanderbilt fellows that, uh, because there's a whole series of really, really very able folks. Um, the, um, uh, I think, uh, Arthur Mason, back at the beginning of the story back at Brook, was an outstanding example. He became chief of lab. Uh, we um, had, of course, a number of marvelous people at, um, at uh, Walter Reed, uh, Bob Schreier and Carl Knopf, uh, Craig Tischer. They were all at the same time. And what a powerhouse that was, yes. as you can imagine. Yes. And to have those as, uh, as colleagues in the... Um, in, and Bill Sirks uh, was, of course, active in the micropuncture field and so on. So the pathogenesis of renal failure was expanded by, by the studies that he did. Yeah. And, uh, so the, and the association here with, uh, with Earl Ginn was mighty fine because yeah. he was very much concerned yeah. with, with doing the dialysis right. Coming back to the issue of the coach-player mm -hmm. paradigm that you've talked about, I wondered whether, as you look at what's happening right now, both in terms of the patient's acceptance of the idea, the, the, the physician acceptance, and then as we all deal with it, with the societal insurance providers and all, how do you see that all playing together? <laughs> uh, and yes, well, the crystal ball does get a little murky about yeah. that time. and. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to play out. I would imagine that the Healthcare Financing Administration would be unhappy about increasing the amount of dialysis. Uh, I think that, that it back up in the uh, progressive renal disease pre-end stage area, that um, the pressures, so the economic pressures of uh, having to run many patients through the system of decreasing number of healthcare personnel uh, of lesser and lesser educational quality, uh, then, uh, then having to spend less and less time per patient is exactly opposite to the initial investments that are necessary to get patients to come around to be their own managers. Yeah. 
my guess is, in the in the long run, that uh, uh, that a couple three things will triumph. Now, I don't know how to get from here to there exactly, but I think it's going to be evident that the basic purposes of all chronic medical care are going to be achieved by the coach player model through health assurance coaching. That is to say, improved access to quality care at reduced cost. And I think when the truth of that is borne in on enough folks, that we're going to see the change. After all, the patient has access to him and herself all the time. That is all the waking hours. So there is improved access. The quality care comes from coaching that is, that is adhered to as the person's in understanding and confidence and competence builds in taking care of himself. Patients tend to avoid doing dumb things when they understand the consequences of doing dumb things. Now, not all patients do all the time, but the tendency is going to be for quality health care when it is well instructed and, and uh, gets into, into a personal practice of self-maintaining patients. Now, the assumption is that when that care is competent and well coached, the likelihood is, that, and if the patient understands finally that he's worth enough so he doesn't have to do dumb things that are self-destructive, then it follows that the patient ought to be, uh, you know, healthier and as such might see the provider less often and might use health resources less and therefore the cost goes down. And I would think providers would be delighted to have patients be so competent that they're just uh, in touch by phone when they get into questions, when intercurrent events turn up, and uh, that they wouldn't turn up in emergency rooms and having to be admitted to hospitals because they already know how to stay out of those things. I can only hope that as the new thoughts and the new paradigm shift that you have uh, helped crystallize in terms of the treatment of acute renal failure and the preventive and wa you know waiting for uh, acting on the illness before it is completely manifested at the level of the disease and before perhaps the illness manifests will finally catch on with the current state of healthcare in the world and in particular in this country because empowering the patients is clearly one way in which we can all benefit from and uh, save a lot of cost to society. Well, that's that's been a wonderful career and it's really, I've learned a lot from it. Uh, just to give, if you were to look back and pick one or two things that you want to highlight and recognize in your careers, what, what would you say mm -hmm. that those would be? Well, that's an interesting, interesting question. Usually, uh, some people have uh, focused on that Korean War business and using the artificial kidney in a rice paddy. I consider that sort of preamble. To me, the most important thing that's happened was the paradigm shift to daily dialysis. That is to say, preventing the illness and the chemical abnormalities and, and, uh, and uh, allowing patients to go through their renal failure as if they didn't have renal failure. That idea, to me, was the most important uh, thing, prophylactic daily dialysis, and to see how that's eventuated has been a really, uh, it's still touch and go, but uh, I think it's very promising. I think the, uh, the second um, issue really had to do with uh, sort of a different paradigm, rejecting fundamentally this ischemia idea and going for a, a, um, a um, uh, acute renal failure model that works and document the fact that it's analogous to the human and then get on to it. I didn't mention, I think, before that we found that um, any agent, with a couple exceptions, that would produce diuresis before the injection that induced the lesion, the diuretic producing agents would prevent the lesion. The ones that did not produce diuresis did not produce, did not prevent the lesion. So we got into the preventive part. We never did work out the pathogenetic issues that, uh, that were involved. We tried and there are some publications, but that's not a completed issue. Uh, 
I think the um, the next uh, uh, big, uh, to me, the next big insight or the change in thinking had to do with recognizing that illness behavior is, is produced by the central nervous system and that objective measures of central nervous system function could detect the function of the marker system, which generated the symptoms. So therefore, we could use this intrinsic uh, uh, marker or detector system as a way of seeing what the impact of therapy was. So the, the, that, con that, that construct that said the CNS was fundamental to understanding the way the illness worked was a really a that was a new development which nobody seemed to be excited about, but we were excited about it. And that's why I consider it sort of important. That then led to the solute symptom connection. That is to say, to the possibilities for solute specific dialysis, that we could prevent dialysis of selected moieties, or we could add single ones and see if they had anything to do with the marker system. So mm -hmm. instead of having a whole battery of tests with yes. all yes. Uh, Chem 22 yeah. items, you would measure EEG and that mm -hmm. would give you a comprehensive yeah. look at... See, our basic assumption was that nothing we conventionally measure in the lab has anything to do with it, with the illness. So the question is, what does? Well, it turns out, I think, our first experiment, which was the last in the series that we could do, uh, showed that it was uh, a little of both. Uh, something that we, that's already measured contributes something, but there are other things that we don't measure that also contribute something, and we had to leave it there, Good. unfortunately. And then the final thing, which is really a work in progress, it's not a, I don't know that it's a legacy primarily for me. I think the term health assurance coaching and the uh, term uh, and the sense of using a coach-player model and hooking those together is a departure in, in a sense. I think it's beyond where disease management literature is currently operating. Yes. And so I hope that uh, when we really get to that and use the MDRD learnings and put that into general practice for chronic medical disease, then I think that might be a terribly important legacy. But it's much too early to tell. It's just. It's sort of a legacy that you look to in the future, which I think is a contradiction in terms, but then that's all right. Yeah. Uh, and so it's been an exciting time, and I don't think we're through yet. Good. Thank you very much, Fair Paul. Enough. Well, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate your sure. this stuff. Sure. Good. Okay.